welcome back everybody uh this is another episode of in right in conversation with in conversation in conversation uh, my name is fernando martinez i am one of your hosts and i'm jefferson denham i'm another of your hosts and today we're gonna get sad i'm just kidding uh we're gonna talk about, <laughs> i mean we might uh so we might today, yeah so today we're gonna talk about something that um something that you i feel like you have been very um open about uh something that you've you know you've really pushed other people to sort of um look out for and just i don't know you're a big proponent of mental health right and so that's what we want to talk about today um and obviously we were just talking for like a minute or two right before this and we were just discussing how like there's a lot of changes happening a lot of things are happening we're sort of just keeping up with the times um i think a lot of us are making new discoveries you know um and so i wanted to start off by asking you um because this is something that we've discussed uh, since we've known each other right since, since we became friends but um you have been very open about uh you know struggling with mental mental health issues and and um i wanted to know what that was like for you um before we met and what what was that like once we did meet and you joined pe yeah um and this is for everybody watching uh fernando and i were talking earlier i am a big big proponent of uh, therapy, asking for help, because when I first started on my journey uh, and I was suffering, uh, I didn't know I was clinically depressed. I didn't know I had severe depression as a diagnosis. I just knew I was effed up and I couldn't keep my head in the game. I just wanted to self-destroy because of pain. And I remember I look in some journal entries and it's like, why should I try to stay alive? so other people can feel okay. They don't understand the pain I'm in. I just wanna end it. And why isn't that merciful? Why isn't that understood? So we can unpack all that. But anyway, so for my journey, I, I did find uh, when I first got into therapy, which was hard because my dad was a, a celebrity athlete. Mm. And so you're kind of indoctrinated with this idea of you know, being a man, a real man, toughs it out or figures it out. Right. But I was really never, you know, because he was not a nice father figure. It was able, I was able to reject a lot of it. There's so much, dear listener, <laughs> viewer, there's so much baggage we don't know we're carrying with us, right? It's sort of like a whale. Do you ever see like pictures or uh, National Geographic films with all these barnacles? And we're talking like tons of barnacles on a whale they attach over the lifespan of a whale. And I just thought to myself, that's, God damn it, that's me. And so you don't realize what all the crap that, that's influencing your day to day and your, um, and your thinking. Anyway, so when I first got to therapy, that was kind of a hard thing. Nobody I knew had ever been, a friend had, but like not nobody in my family had ever been to therapy. Was there, was there like a lot of stigma at the time with therapy? Yes, because I was also heavy uh, fundamentalist Christian. And so a lot of their counsel was you got to pray more and read your Bible and that's all you need. And I would think to myself, okay, that's great. So I'm just going to hold my Bible while I jump off a bridge. Thank you very much. And uh, obviously that's baloney and not all Christians think that way, but the circles I was in, had that vibe to it. So that was, I had to break through all that thinking like I was disobeying God and I was not being a real man or whatever. And at some point you go, you know what, F all that. I'm just gonna do what I gotta do. This is my mantra. I gotta do what I gotta do to be well. I gotta do what I gotta do to get through yet another day. I was in the, my group therapy session on, on Thursday and they said, so, you know, they go around the Zoom call and they say, what's a goal? What's a short term goal? That you're shooting for and my particular answer was i want to be able to get up tomorrow and make my bed there's another guy who he and i kind of talk to each other he's also struggles with severe depression and he says if i can just make my bed i know i won't get back in it mm -hmm. right 
anyway, so it's like that. You measure your successes uh, not on some grand scale, but on little victories. So going to therapy in the first place was a little victory that turned out to be a big victory because, you know, you start unpacking again, all of these forces that are having their way with you. And because they're subconscious, you don't recognize that you are kind of like a victim in a way to the whims of these many times other voices that you've just sort of inherited and internalized. And a lot of them are negative. A lot of them are punishing you. So by the time I got to Northridge, I had been a, a warrior, a veteran of mental health wars. And, and the thing is uh, what I found, and, uh, and for anybody watching who's been in therapy, I wonder if you think this too, sometimes you know, understanding it is fantastic. Understanding where these th things came from is fantastic. You're not blaming, really. I mean, I could. At first, you go, man, that guy fucked me up. I'm talking about a parent figure. But at some point, you got to say, okay, now uh, that's the way it came to me. Now I've got to do something about it, and you own your own life. Uh, but that's not easy, right? You've got a whole lifetime of living certain ways with all the negative impulses that feel so familiar that you just kind of lean into them because they're familiar even if they're toxic and not good for you so by the time i got to northridge you know it's always been a struggle and it's really tough and again for our viewers anybody who's uh in school and you struggle with depression yay you because it is harder than hell to when you just feel like you want to sink uh, and, and curl up in a ball, God knows I still do, you know, from time to time. But you got to kind of, you know, acknowledge that this is pretty badass if you're trying to make something happen, because it is a struggle. So our classmate, uh, Serena, used to tell me, I don't know how you do it, because she started to explore, you know, therapy at uh, the college, which was great. Uh, again, I advocate go. If you need help, ask for it and get it. Uh, and it's it's available to you. And we can talk about that later, but maybe some recommendations of how to get a hold of it. But anyway, so not everybody sees it. It's not a wound that you see like a broken leg. It's just like this dark, uh, you know, the barnacles or whatever that can sink you. And uh, just dealing with it, it can be exhausting, but you also recognize that, you know, this is my lot in life and I'm going to just do whatever I got to do to stay well for one more day. Um, so there's a long answer to your short question. So I have a question back to you. Yeah. And do you, I hope you don't mind me sharing that you're in therapy now too. Is that okay yeah. to say? Yeah. And so what led you to, because you're a sensitive guy and you're, you're, mm -hmm. You have a lot of, <laughs> you are, yeah. and you have a lot of insight. And yet, again, I, I, I kind of am teeing this up because I think I know what you're going to say, but why did you decide then that now's the time to go into therapy for yourself? Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, for me, I feel like a lot of this honestly goes back years and years right because like you said it, it's one of those things where uh you don't recognize like it's not a wound that you can like identify immediately um and the way that i like to compare it to is this story that on it i'm pretty sure I, i'm stealing from this animation whatever um but it's a story of a boy who you know has a giant basket and he has all these vegetables um and he's going around town and everybody's telling him hey like i don't you know like i'm struggling over here like i need food is there any way you can help me and so the boy gives him a piece a piece of whatever item he has and he goes around and every time he bumps into somebody a person is struggling for xyz and so the boy continues to give out everything that he has until the end when he gets home and it's time to eat he realizes he has nothing um, and so that I think is what I like to compare it to. It's like, um, I think my entire life, I've always sort of been the, the shoulder for other people, you know, and 
and while I don't dislike that, you know, I enjoy being that for people, I recognize that I was never acknowledging that I needed a shoulder too, you know? And I mean, like right now, a lot of changes are happening. Um, and it's just, I'm like, honestly, the biggest one is, is with school. Like I've, you know, shared with you and obviously all my friends, but like I'm going away for school. And I may not know exactly where that is right now, but I know that I'm leaving and I'm going somewhere and I'm going to be um, not home for six years. And that to me is insane. And that's when I realized, like, I have a lot of things that I think became baggage when I was here and I don't want to take that with me. And I'm struggling with with a lot of the, the coping I've, I've been struggling with. And so I decided, you know what? I feel like I've been having these conversations uh, so much so that like obviously the phone has been recording my conversations and now I'm getting advertisements for therapy and stuff and one of them appeared and it was for for the um, online therapy uh, format obviously with with COVID and everything and so I signed up and I was like this is scary but I signed up and so that's sort of how it happened but I, honestly it's that realization that like since I was a kid I've like felt things that I couldn't explain at the time that now looking back I recognize like oh I was a depressed child and I didn't even realize it um and so I I think that's what ended up happening I think that's why I ended up here now in therapy and you know sharing it with you before we started recording was awesome because it's like we've been talking about it for so long and it's like finally like <laughs> we're both in therapy at the same time I know I know and so for anybody that uh, is curious about therapy again I just want to I'm probably going to say this up multiple times in our conversation check it out and uh I would love to share resources uh from what little I know especially if you don't have health insurance there are ways to still get a hold of it you know what I love Fernando about you sharing what you shared there's something I learned in therapy, and that is you mentioned coping coping skills, coping mechanisms. We all develop as we're children ways of dealing with horrible trauma or stress, or maybe not even horrible, but stressors and trauma. And those skills that we just had to rely on, let's say at 10 years old, maybe at 20, 25, don't serve us so well, right? And so this is one thing my therapist would challenge me on it's like for example wanting to just stop the uh psychological abuse raining down on me well i would acquiesce to my father and i would just try to make peace right at any cost and uh it makes you fearful of challenges it makes you think that oh my god if there's any sort of disagreement it's life or death so dear audience if you see what i'm getting at here it's like you you one of the phrases I learned in my latest uh, program was catastrophizing. I love that word, catastrophizing. So that means taking the situation, which could be challenging, and then making it way bigger than it is, right? And so uh, there's a couple of things I was just going to share, Fernando, if you don't mind me doing this. There, at my last uh, session, uh, the facilitator shared a TED talk, which I will share with you. It's from 2017. The speaker was Susan David. I can't remember exactly the name of it, but it's talking about dealing with your emotions in a healthy way. And so there's just a couple of notes I made. And I just want to share with all y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, label your emotions accurately. So that would be the opposite of catastrophizing. Like if you have an emotion, just say what it is but it doesn't get to own you. It doesn't get to rule you. And uh, to that point, she added, our emotions don't own us. They let them lead us to a pathway to our best selves. In other words, emotions are just data, just information. They're not directives. So she said, I feel it's healthy to say, I feel sad versus I am sad, right? where you attach your identity to it versus just seeing what is. So um, feel, she, her, the big takeaway for her was feel these emotional truths. Don't downplay them. I know if Fernando, you or anybody watching, if you've ever been in situations where you tried to share maybe something that you're going through that maybe is dark and people didn't want to hear it. You thought, okay, well, I can't be honest. I can't be emotionally honest with that person or in general. And that's one of those little lessons where we have to kind of confront that way of thinking and go, okay, wait, 
Yeah. I can feel emotional truths. I just don't, they don't get to rule over me, you know? And so we have these little decisions that we've made sometimes to survive, right? Uh, and sometimes it's really good to revisit those decisions we've made and rethink them. Another, and then I'm going to ask you a question, but one other thing that I just feel like I want to share right now is uh, one of the coping skills, they call them coping skills in this program I was in, uh, is called thought challenge. And here's how it goes. A thought comes and it could be the same old kind of thought, oh, I suck. There you go. You tried something new and you failed because that's who you are. You're a loser, right? Uh, I'm just letting you in on some of my, it's not pleasant. Uh, but so the thought challenge exercise is, okay, there's a thought. I'm going to challenge it. I hear you thought, and I'm going to challenge it and say, I'm going to call bullshit on that. I didn't know I could do that. I just thought because I had it, it must be true. And you just felt victimized by those thoughts. Like they were just going to have their way with you. But now you go, and wait a minute, I can, I can actually challenge that thought. In your journey right now, what are you, I know you're feeling kind of like, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what, what are, if someone's thinking about trying therapy, what are some of the, the sort of ahas or revelations that you're experiencing right now? And I know you're new at it too, but do you have anything like that going on? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think I, honestly, and I don't know, I don't know if it's like an, like an aha moment, right. But it is something that I, that I recognized is powerful for me is recognizing that or i guess it's, it's realizing that we don't recognize how powerful we can be the fact that we do have the ability to do something and, and obviously that doesn't mean that it's an automatic fix because it's not right and i think it'd be unfair to say that but to, to say that um you know if, if you've lived your entire life not being comfortable telling somebody something because of how they're going to receive it right which obviously you have experienced and I have experienced in my life too that at the end of the day as scary as it may be you do have the power of making a phone call of filling up an email of doing a trial period of doing all these things that might make a difference in your life you know and I think I think it's powerful the fact that like just it that it might is is so motivating for me it's not an it's not like a, a, a sure thing and typically that would scare me with anything else all right why would you apply to a job if it's not a sure thing why would you um i don't know ask somebody something ask somebody out if it's not a sure thing why would you you know try to um get yourself a suit for an interview or for something for anything if it's not a sure thing and i think a lot of times we scare ourselves when we think that but with this when i told myself it's not a sure thing but there's hope in that, you know? And so I think that was the moment for me. Um, yeah, and, and, and so I there was something else that you said that I was trying to respond to that I am blanking out on. I think it was, um, no, I think it was that it was, it was sort of communicating these things to other people, right? So sort of opening up. And I feel like this is a really good segue into um, connecting this with with our performance experience because um as a kid like i said before I, I think when i look back in my life i recognized that i was a depressed kid there were a lot of things like um losing interest in, in the activities that i had i was struggling to make connections with people um issues with oversharing i oversharing a lot right or I used to, and then I forced myself to stop. Um, what do you mean by that? Do you mind if I pause you and say, okay, how did that manifest itself? And how do you know that was not a healthy thing for you? Yeah, so I mean, it, it was like, um, because I struggled to make connections, right? Uh, when I did, and I, and I found people that I could talk to, even as a kid, right? So it, it might have been super, uh, it might have been a lot of superficial conversational topics as you're a child, right? What are you going to talk about when you're a child? Um, when I was able to find these connections, it's like, I just, it was just a lot of word vomit, you know? And sometimes like I would say things like, oh, um, I will talk about how I don't have friends. I don't have this. Like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. It's a lot of like, 
uh, woe is me almost kind of things that I would say. And I started to recognize that a lot of people didn't want to hear that. Do you tell, okay, so that's very interesting. Do you feel like it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy? It's like, okay, people don't like me. So I, oh, you'll listen. I'm just going to word vomit on you. Oh, now you don't like me. I knew it. Right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Like, I think you, you sort of lie to yourself that way. Right. And, and it's kind of hard not to, especially if that's been the pattern your entire life. And so, um, so that's what it was like, I think, in a social group. And then um, obviously, like I started making more friends and I and I don't think it was because of anything I was doing. I think they just tolerated me because I was really quiet. I never like got in anybody's way. I never did anything. Um, I was just like angsty and by myself in the corner with this giant group of people. Um, and then when it came to communicating some of these problems with my parents, I think when I was in, in high school, um, they didn't know how to respond and i don't and i i mean i don't believe it was like willful ignorance but a lot of it is like cultural ignorance right um a lot of it is tied to religion a lot of it is tied to how they were raised um you know like you have <laughs> a lot of our parents like anybody that's a millennial now who had parents grew up in an era especially if they were immigrants in an era of like machismo and toxic masculinity even in this country and so while they weren't dismissive they also weren't necessarily um proactive about anything um it was just like here have a glass of water go get some sleep like i've been sleeping a lot i don't want to sleep you know um and so then here comes pe and it's this really <laughs> weird space um it feels like everybody's oversharing but then you recognize like nobody's oversharing like people are just talking like that's what it is people are just saying what they want to say and if you want to listen to it, you will. And if you don't, you don't have to, but everybody listened. Um, and I I think that was sort of, I don't know, it was a really weird experience for me to, to be able to say these things to a group of people that, that at the time were strangers, right? Um, and so, again, not saying that this is a, a, a cure for anything, because it's not. But I think that there was a lot of therapeutic um aspects to being in performance yeah i just want to add to that i think that what we're touching on and again if you're watching and you're thinking uh maybe it, one thing you said earlier so i'm going to get back to it is fear the idea of fear and uh i remember reading a quote something like this uh that everything we want is on the other side of fear and so in applying that to performance ensemble, we have a lot of private thoughts. I don't know. Have you ever seen the, the website Post Secret? No. So I, I'm going to share that with our audience too. Postsecret.com, I think. And so it's a collection of a bunch of writings that are all done anonymous. But it's your deepest, darkest fears, feelings, and thoughts. And it's fascinating this is, and I'm coming back to the PE. It's fascinating because the human condition unfiltered is fascinating. To get along in society, we've got a ton of filters that we feel like we have to put on. And some of them are legit. You just behave a certain way in a job interview, for example. You don't put your feet up on the desk and say, can I tell you about the time I was abused as a child? You don't do that. <laughs> but, yeah. but in the space like performance ensemble, it is so... Uh, I think this is what you were alluding to. It's so freeing, uh, scary, mm -hmm. because you're 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 saying these are my private thoughts that I'm kind of terrified to tell anybody about because I feel like I'm going to get judged or put down or thought less of because I'm sharing something that's just brutally human. And what we realize in artistic space whether it's PE, whether it's poetry, whether it's music, whatever, the more vulnerable and real and, and raw uh, that is, the more it, it resonates because we're all, you know, walking through our daily lives with a good layer of filters on. And for good reason. I mean, the, the world can be a scary place. And so you got to have some armor, but sometimes you get tired of carrying that armor. It gets so fucking heavy. And then you can, in spaces like performance ensemble, 
you are allowed in a safe place where others are trying to get to that uh, honest emotion too, in their own truth, you're all trying to get there. And what's beautiful about it too, I'm just gonna speak for me and Fernando, please jump in with yours. But for me, it was like, I have these thoughts, I have these feelings and to bring them out, sometimes they need to be challenged. So you're just going all along in your own world. And for me, because of depression, my own prison, if I can put it that way. And for you to bring out these thoughts and then you realize, wait, wait a minute. It's kind of like along the lines of the thought challenge thing I said earlier. To bring them out and put them into a space, you can really examine it for what it really is in the light versus letting it linger in the dark and influence you in ways maybe you don't want. So it just feels so amazing to be able to just be honestly yourself and be challenged to be your better self by sharing your innermost thoughts and feelings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, because it, it honestly, it also makes me think back to my experiences. Um, because I think I sort of I sort of went over this story of what my first performance was like and how like it was just a heaping mess, right? It's like I forgot my lines and this and that. Um, so the, I mean, like the content of that piece was about things that I was struggling with, and while it wasn't specifically only mental health, it was a lot of other things that I was struggling with. But it was a part of it, right? And so, um. Honestly, I, I feel like in addition to having written a little bit too much and not being able to memorize because I wasn't an experienced performer, um, not to say that I'm like any good now, but like I just wasn't experienced back then, right? And um, I think another part of it too was the content of the message that I was trying to disseminate. And it was really hard for me because everybody in that room had heard me talk about it and they were all supportive and it felt like a family and they were like, ready to take care of me if they had to take care of me right like that's what it was like in there and i think that there was a moment where when i was on stage um and i was looking at all these strangers in the audience it's like oh i have to do this again like i have to be vulnerable and open up and say things that i thought i was done saying and i thought i was like over it and i thought i was okay and, and clearly i wasn't <laughs> you know um because like I said, not, not not everything can feel like a cure like in the moment, right? But it is a step in the right direction. And so that's what it was for me. And um, I think that as time went by, um, I started doing this really weird thing of like, you're a performer, you're an artist. So sort of, you know, I, I live off of, feed off of the sad, <laughs> you know, feed off of the, the beaten down and stuff and use that as as your motivation to perform. And so that's what I did. And, and honestly, it it sounds so unhealthy, but that's what I was doing. It's like, whenever we would go perform or we would go travel and perform out of state at these festivals and stuff, I would um, listen to albums that I, um, I always used to rely on when I was like having a hard time. So I was just like, get really in the zone of like, just being, um, remembering of when I, when I was at my lowest and I would get super bummed out and, and people are like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, no, like I, I need this. Like I need to do this. And it was just insane. Um, it wasn't, I think it did something for me at first. And I think that at the end it might've been unhealthy, but I think it shows progression too, because after that I started to recognize that what we were doing, it was writing and performing works of social justice. Right. And when we think of that, we think of, of, um, socio-political and economic um, issues of justice. What we don't realize is that it also means personal justice and mental health falls under that. So, you know, you can be your own advocate, you can fight for yourself, you can fight for the things that you're struggling with. And I think when I made that distinction, I was like, okay, I think there's a better way to do this. There's a better way to get out the things that I'm feeling. And so what I started doing was um, whenever I would write about topics that I cared about, so gentrification in LA, which is a really big one that I like to talk about, is I wrote it about that and that was the intention, but I also used it as a way to reflect how I feel on an emotional level. And it was really difficult to do that, but that's what it ended up doing for me. And I think that's when it became healthy. And I think that's what performance did for me in terms of 
um, I guess, existing in that space while also struggling with my own mental health. Well, let's uh, face it, like our life, what the way you are dealing with life now, the thoughts you're having right in this moment, mm -hmm. you're going to evolve. Mm -hmm. well, at least I hope we all do. And so what's serving us well now may not serve us well tomorrow. And so you gave yourself license to adapt, to change, to find ways to, because there's more than one. Can I just get back to what you were saying about accessing your uh, depressive music or whatever? I used to do that whenever I was in a, a scene as an actor. Yeah. And it's helpful, but uh, alluding to my, uh, my therapy uh, group that I just graduated from, I recognized something. A lot of my uh, people in my class uh, were dealing with uh, alcohol addiction, drug addiction. And I just had an epiphany. This is kind of along what you were thinking, saying, I think. Uh, I was addicted to depression. In other words, yes, it's a condition I have, but it's also a go-to, right? It's like, uh, I just am going to always default to the darkest possible part of me. And instead of recognizing we have multifaceted emotions, it's never just one thing, ever. And so to deny the possibility of other positive emotions, because I just so happen to be addicted to and familiar with the darker emotions of myself, I think it limits us as artists. I think it limits, well, it limits me as a human because there's more rooms to explore it's never just one thing and so i love that pe for me gave me the opportunity to keep evolving emotionally and keep exploring and so yeah you're going to have these new epiphanies that you can make new decisions and uh and and, and decide that i'm going to kind of grow keep growing emotionally uh, and it doesn't I, I used to think tell me if you agree but I used to think if someone's just happy, I felt like, well, you are a, on a lesser emotional plane than me. I'm just so much because I'm so deep and I'm so dark. And uh, <laughs> I'm realizing that's just not healthy either. I mean, you know, to be your own advocate, this is what you were just saying. To be your own advocate means uh, I just did this. I have another podcast. I'm sure I mentioned it here. Uh, and we interviewed, um, uh, do you know who Lisa Gibbons is? No, who is she? She used to be a she used to be a co-host of Entertainment Tonight, and she's been uh, you know just a, a TV fixture. She's kind of a spokesperson and a TV journalist. Anyway, so she's got this foundation where they help the caregivers. They help the caregivers because her mom had Alzheimer's, and she recognized that she was so depleted. This is kind of along the lines of what you were saying about the basket idea. You go around and you give away more and more and more of yourself. Pretty soon you got nothing. And so she wrote a book. It's something like this, like take the oxygen first. And you know that analogy of like when you're on an airplane, if the, if the air masks come down, mm -hmm. you put it on yourself first and then you help the child next to you kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly what you were saying, Fernando. If, if we are not being an advocate for ourselves, if we're not doing the things that are healthy, to enable to replenish ourselves. And by the way, PE does that, I just wanna say. Uh, then you've got nothing to give. As much as you think, I love giving to people, I love, and I think most of our viewers do feel this way. You wanna show up for people, you wanna you know, be generous. Uh, look at all the people in Texas. I just saw a story today where everyday people are showing up for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all wanna be that. We, I think that's a natural inclination and it feels good to do it. but it, it's so difficult to then do that for yourself, right? And so I, I love exploring these kinds of thoughts. And this is what therapy does for me too. It reminds me that you gotta, you gotta, if you don't replenish the well, you got nothing to draw from to give to anybody else. And I know for me, again, I'm just gonna say this uh, because I repeat myself, I'm old, I'm allowed to. Um, going through PE was a replenishment. It was like, uh, yes, it's challenging and whatnot, but it also feeds your soul, right? And so that, to me, just getting back to what you had said, the self-care idea or being your own advocate, I find PE to be a big part of, how, uh, could be a big part of your journey 
in doing just that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that I, because I, I wanted to ask you too, because um, for anybody that's listening, you were with us for a semester and um, which <laughs> ended up being my favorite semester, I think, of all time. So <laughs> I think you had something to do with that. But you were with us for a semester um, and then you weren't for the next one. And then, you you know, you moved on to, to a different school and, and all that stuff. Um, but was there any was there a moment where you started to recognize that maybe you were personally struggling um, in that semester that you were with us? Or was there any experiences that you had with that while we were while we were performing? This is a great question, and I'm just going to be. I'm just going to be brutally honest. Yeah, that following semester, I just crashed. Uh, I don't want to sound alarmed. I don't want to alarm you or anybody, but I just felt like, and I knew it was, I was in between meds and the meds were not working. So for those of you watching who are severely depressed like me, I think you'll know what I'm, this, this is a terrible place to be in. And I went down to a railroad track and I just laid on the tracks. This was like at midnight. I'm thinking, this, I just got to put myself out of this misery. But uh, so, yeah, I dropped out of uh, PE. I stopped. Uh, what else did I do? I guess that was the big thing. And I was just struggling to stay in school. That was a tough semester, no doubt. And giving up PE sucked because you guys were going to go, we were going to travel and uh, so forth. And I just, I just could not. It was all I could do just to get out of bed or try to do a paper or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to share that, that that was really a tough thing. And I missed PE, but uh, I just could. I was in survival mode. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, too, I, you know, I, I think that as we talk about this, obviously, we're not um, like, we don't want to use this as a way to promote, like, yeah, come join us. Like, no, like you don't, you know, like that's not what it is. It's just, I think recognizing that, um, there are beautiful aspects to it that can provide us with, with better ways to cope or with better ways to, to sort of, um, I think let go of certain things, right. To open up, to, to, to start conversations, to, um, show people that we can be, practicing self-advocacy um and i think a part of that too is knowing when to stop and and i think that's important too right like you have mm. to know when you have to stop and i think you made that realization um when you left because obviously you were taking care of yourself first and why wouldn't well, you? like that's what you have to do that's a great point and one of the cool things i will say is that the affection i felt for everybody in pe did not diminish the strong emotional ties and friendships that I developed continued whether I was in PE or not. I was always, you know, I would always seek you out and we would hang out. And I just felt like even if I wasn't in the group that particular semester, the emotional bonds you make through such a powerful, you know, experience uh, really are life changing and, you know, lifelong. I, I love hanging. I mean, I told you, I tell you this all the time, hanging out with you rejuvenates my soul. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're here. Um, right? But yeah, I, I think that's actually one thing to also recognize is like what you can do when you're in the right space, when you're in the right environment with the right people is even if you're there for one reason, there's so many other things that you can get out of it. And I think that's what we can do here. It's like, I can perform politics all day and I will because I'm pissed, right? But I'm also going to do things for me. And I'm also going to talk about my mental health. And I'm also going to be there for people who are talking about it too. And I think it's just like performing who you are at the end of the day is what you can do here too. And, um, you know, I think it's just interesting to hear about, hear these stories about how we navigate um, our coping, our struggles, or our personal victories, which to me, I like start to highlight more often. I start to give more credit to, right? So like just having personal victories when it comes with our mental health, I think is very important. Um, 
Is there anything else that you wanted to say um, to our audience before we head out? Yeah, just one quick thing I'm going to say. Um, well, two quick things. <laughs> First is to reiterate what I said earlier, get help if you need it. As, we're, as you can see, I guess a theme of today is take time for yourself, be your own advocate. And there are ways to get therapy even if you don't have insurance. So I know when I first started out, I found colleges where people were studying to be therapists and you can usually, they need hours. So I think it was like for 20 bucks an hour, I was able to get therapy. You just get creative and it, the opportunity, those kind of things are available. And then if you're at school, I think you can get, I think you get like 10 sessions or something. Uh, so ask for help. Um, and then specific to performance and so I love what you were just saying and I'm just gonna kind of tag on that. Performance, most, our lives are a performance. We're playing a role all the time. And what's cool about performance ensemble is you're performing, yes, but you're performing your authentic real self. And it's just making space for something like that in your life is enormous. So whether it's something like PE or whatever rejuvenates your soul, I recommend hanging out with Fernando. That does it for me. Uh, be aware of what does it for you and what, what helps you feel replenished so that you can go on to help other people. Yeah, I, yeah, that was absolutely, that was beautiful. And um, just one quick thing too, obviously the, the things that we talked about today, we, we've talked about them from our perspectives, right? And so from our privileges, from our standpoint, and, and we understand that it may not be the case for everybody, um, be it social, cultural, financial, whatever, um, but we do hope that this was something that um, will give you something to think about, right? That you can use um, if you want to use or you can discard if you want to discard it. Um, and yeah, I feel like I want to do this more often, <laughs> you know, like I want to have more, um, talk more about performance, but also the sides of performance that we don't really um, address as often. And I think this is one of them. So yeah this has been uh, csun's uh, performance ensembles in conversation uh, my name is fernando martinez i'm one of your hosts and i'm jefferson denham i'm the other host today and this is going to be the part where we wave goodbye <laughs> <laughs>